welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief, Naval History Magazine, and today we're going to revisit significant events that occurred in the Battle of the Atlantic 80 years ago, this very time of the year. Um, major losses to the U-boats early in 1943 had sparked fears of German victory at sea in the Atlantic until the Allies mounted a stunning turnaround that finally drove off the wolf packs. And here to discuss this fantastic article in the current issue of Naval History, From Crisis to Victory in the North Atlantic, we're pleased to welcome back Ed Offley. Ed, hello again. Eric, good morning, Eric. Uh, it's great to have you in the magazine again. Um, pretty much since the beginning of the um, 80th anniversary of the Battle of the Atlantic heating up uh, with Operation Drumbeat, uh, you've been chronicling the different phases and aspects of it for us in the magazine. It's been really wonderful. And this is sort of the capstone piece of that in that it shows the uh, final uh, way we sort of figured out a way to um, keep the wolf pack thread at bay in the North Atlantic. So um, why don't you uh, dive right into that? Uh, just to remind people, Ed is a historian uh, who's written a number of books about the Battle of the Atlantic. So he's the go-to guy for this subject matter. And it's always a pleasure to have him in the magazine, uh, this article being no exception. So why don't you set the stage for us of like how things were looking dire in the earlier part of 1943 before we launched that stunning turnaround in a fairly short amount of time? It was an incredible short amount of time. Uh, what happened was, and I, I want to just back up one or two steps further, what people, I think, come to appreciate when they start studying this is that the Battle of the Atlantic, I think, is the longest battle in recorded history, if you, you stick to the definitions of what a battle is. Um, you think about our major battles in our nation's history, Gettysburg, Midway, um, any of those, like, they were measured in days. The Battle of Gettysburg, I think, lasted three days, as did the Battle of Midway out there in the uh, Central Pacific. The Battle of the Atlantic lasted. 1,773 days. It started the day that England uh, declared war on Germany in 1930, September 1939, and it ended the day before the German surrender on uh, May the 7th or 8th, I think, 1945. It was like a carpet, burning carpet fire that smoldered and exploded into flames and went this way and that way for literally the entire length of World War II. So in 1943, what had happened was uh, both Germany and the United States and to a degree Britain, as usual, when the war broke out for each of the countries, that they weren't prepared for it. You know, everybody had a grandiose plan. Uh, German Admiral Karl Deunitz, who commanded the U-boat force, had gotten Hitler's permission to build a force of 300 combat-ready U-boats who would go out into the Atlantic Mediterranean and other other seas, essentially to destroy as much Allied shipping as they could. His his simple strategy for winning World War II was to cut the supply pipeline, the maritime uh, trade routes between the United States and England. By doing that, he would he would hopefully starve the English out of the war and then preserve the European gains for Adolf Hitler. And that was his his goal throughout. Well, what happened was. Uh, he started late and had to catch up. And it wasn't until early 1943 that he finally had enough U-boats who could deploy into the Atlantic to actually start really causing serious damage to the Allied convoys in our, in our, in our trade routes uh, to England. Um, just a quick two numbers. At the outside of the fight in World War II in September of 39, uh, Doinus only had 36 U-boats that could get underway. Uh, which wasn't enough to do anything. He he himself lamented he was the most unprepared naval commander in the history of war when, when the fighting started. Well, it took four years almost, three, three and a half years, but they built and they constructed and they trained. And by early 43, he suddenly had a large number of, of U-boats that could deploy. In fact, in, in, when the crisis started in March, he was able to have between 36 and 40 U-boats hunting for ships at one time on any given day. And that was enough to cause some real trouble. So what happened was 
um, there are a number of variables that go into any military struggle. And back and forth, uh, the Allies and the Germans over the period of, of the war would have temporary advantage then temporary disadvantage as one or more another events happen. But what happened in March of 43, uh, which was the beginning of, of a two month crisis that had everybody uh, in, Berl uh, in London and Washington and Ottawa, Canada losing sleep at night, was that finally he had enough, Dorinus had enough wolf packs out there to really start to chew up the Allied merchant convoys, bringing more supplies and, and civilian food and fuel to the British Isles. And the, 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 to me, the miraculous turnaround came over a 10-week, 12-week period between mid-March and late May 1943. At the beginning of March, Allies were literally voicing fear that they were about to be uh, losing the Battle of the Atlantic, that, that enough ships would be destroyed, that, that the morale would plummet, the supplies would fall short, and the war effort would falter. Two and a half months later, they drove the U-boats from the North Atlantic. And I was always fascinated by that because as, as a student uh, in my younger days, you know, the, the history's kind of just glossed over it. And I thought, how the hell, you know, did that happen? <coughs> Excuse me. And it turns out, it turns out to have been three different minor, seemingly minor factors that when you look at it were very, very, very minor that turned the balance, turned the tide completely. And the three were between March and May 43, the British Admiral in charge of convoy defenses talked Winston Churchill into canceling the convoys that were running then from Iceland and England up to Russia in Murmansk. And they, they used up a, several dozen destroyers and, and other escorts to protect those shipments. And he talked Churchill into canceling those, those convoys temporarily and rushing those destroyers down to the North Atlantic where they provided just enough reserve backup that they could go after the, the German U-boats as they attacked, you know, east and westbound convoys and in and, and, and the local skirmishing battles make a difference. Second thing, there was a huge area of the North Atlantic throughout much of World War II. It was south, uh, south, southwest of Greenland. Uh, it was this big circle drawn on the map and it was called the Greenland Air Gap. And what it was, they had patrol planes based in Northern Ireland and, and Iceland in Canada that could go out a certain distance and, you know, protect convoys, find the U-boats on the surface, attack them, drive them under. But there was this huge blob of, of ocean where no airplane could reach. This is called the Greenland Air Gap. And that's where Doinet sent all of his U-boat wolfbacks to attack uh, the convoys because without air cover, uh, the U-boats were either equal or had an advantage in, in, in their tactics of stalking and, and, and closing in on convoys. When there was a patrol airplane overhead, it forced them under because the patrol planes could see them, alert the convoys, alert the defenders, and then they could take action to, to you know, to stave off the attacks. Well, in, in most of the war, and in particular during the crisis of March and April of 43, the Allies were very stingy. They, they had these um, long-range bombers, the B-24 Liberators, and everybody wanted them. They were like 10,000 of them built in the war, and everybody wanted them. They wanted them in the Army. The British wanted them to bomb Germany. The U.S. Navy wanted them in the Pacific. And the poor uh, air, uh, Coastal Command, which was the British unit responsible for air cover of our convoys, could not get enough. In fact, during March, I think they only had 12, 12 airplanes, of which usually three to five were at any one time not in any condition. It was literally down to a handful of airplanes. So after this crisis of, of March 43, 
where four convoys were just savaged by over 40 U-boats in each Wolfpack. Um, they were able to persuade Roosevelt and Churchill to get some more of these long-range bombers. The Liberators that they used in the convoy patrol were, were stripped down, all the armor taken out, all the guns, and instead of, uh, they took one of the two bomb bays and put an extra fuel tank in it. So these things can now fly all the way out into the Greenland air gap from Iceland and Northern Ireland and hang around long enough to force the German U-boats to submerge, at which point the convoys could get away from them. And so so the, the, the battle, and it's probably oversimplistic, but I, I keep coming back to it. The Battle of the Atlantic flipped in favor of the Allies because of a dozen British destroyers and a dozen uh, U.S. manufactured B-24 Liberators. And the third thing was um, something that these two factors really helped, and that was the Allies had uh, a 10 centimeter wavelength radar that had been developed by uh, the British and Americans that could find German U-boats from a ship, from an airplane, through the clouds, through the fog, and the Germans never were able to uh, come up with a radar detector that could sense when that beam was on them. And so once they had enough ships and planes to literally cover the defense, that radar capability uh, was the final nail in the U-boat's coffin. And instead, uh, there was a battle, just to give, and I hate to bomb you on numbers, but that's what wartime is about. Um, in March, during the battle of what they call St. Patrick's Day, um, one convoy, uh, Halifax 229, was attacked by 43 U-boats. 43 U-boats, that's more than Joinus had at the entire beginning of the war, at the beginning of the war in his entire fleet. And they sank 13 ships uh, for 114,000 tons of shipping, a lot of, a lot of supplies. They only lost one U-boat during that three-day skirmish. Uh, two and a half months later, another pair of wolf packs jumped a westbound convoy, ONS-5, and they lost eight U-boats and only sank, I think, a dozen ships. And a one-for-one -one ratio of loss, like you sink one Allied merchant ship, but you lose a U-boat, is, is a losing proposition. So in that in that 12-week period, the slightest little extra featherweight on the balance, 12 bombers, a couple dozen warships, flipped the Battle of the Atlantic permanently. And it was it was amazing to 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 read and write about. Yeah, it's it's a remarkable turnaround, and it's really interesting how a tweak here and a tweak there creates this confluence of uh, positive factors that uh, can really turn the tide, which is what happened here. Um, on the other side of the equation, this is just some food for thought. By late '42, Hitler had always been distrustful of his surface fleet. He thought that the surface navy was a um, breeding ground for uh, revolution and uh, communism and agitators and whatnot. He always thought they were like scared to go out and fight. And he never quite knew how to use the surface fleet, right? And he decided to really put all his eggs in the basket of the U-boat war. Right. This is late 42. So his timing was really unfortunate about that because within half of a year, uh, we would have cracked the U-boat problem, essentially. And that was yeah. so he kind of um, shot himself in the foot in terms of naval power by just focusing exclusively on the U boats after a certain point. Well, it you know, I hate to, yeah, I hate to be glib, but you know, he was such a horrible monster and a terrible dictator. But we were very lucky to have Adolf Hitler as our enemy because every time he made a major decision, that usually screwed the German army, the Air Force, or the Navy. Um, it would take a long podcast to just list the screw-ups he did, but but that was yeah. one of them. Yeah, I mean, we we the world is fortunate that he wouldn't listen to his generals and his admirals because they you know they would come to him with here's how we can do this and make it work, and he would see he was so convinced of his own brilliance after uh, the opening of the war that from that point on he thought everything he came up with was he knew better than his general officer staff and the world's lucky that he had that hubris because if he'd yes. listened to it, it could have gone the other way in many chances it could have and, and and you know when you read history and then one thing I, I i i keep a little kind of lead weight next to my head i hit myself with 
is that when you read history, you think it's inevitable. You know, the myth of the inevitability of what happened. Um, I start to sense that things could go either way, you know, on a daily basis. So mm -hmm. we were fortunate that it did, but that doesn't mean it was preordained. Uh, there was a lot of uh, chance along the way. That is an excellent point. In fact, when I teach history, uh, I always make that clear to the students that you're hearing this, you go into the history course you have to go to, and you, you learn this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and you feel like that's just sort of a script. And I try to tell them, none of this was inevitable. History is never inevitable. It could go either way. And there's so many points in history where it could have turned on a dime the other way and everything would have been different. So it's important to think about that when you look back on the, the kind of chronicle of events in chronological order, none of that was inevitable. That's a, that's a very powerful point that uh, needs to be repeated every now and then, I think. Staple it in reverse on your forehead, you know, so you can look in the mirror and read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh well um i started off this to talk about the um feature article in the june 2023 issue from crisis to victory in the north atlantic and um a, a great uh another piece from ed offley covering the battle of the atlantic forest and the u-boat war but ed's actually a, a double threat this uh this month in um naval history he also published with us an online exclusive which is um getting quite a lot of attention on our website. Um, it's getting quite a bit of traffic because it's a great uh, recollection of um, a battleship sailor in World War II who was on USS Nevada, um, Dick Ramsey. And Ed has um, gotten together with this um, wonderful 99-year-old veteran to tell his story of his wartime experiences. It's called Reflections of a Battleship Sailor. So this is a great piece, Ed. Um, very enjoyable, very informative, first-hand account um, from the decks of a ship throughout the war. Uh, how did you first meet uh, Dick Ramsey, and how did this sort of relationship build where you collaborated on him with this? Well, I had thought of an earlier project you know, a number of years ago. To the Nevada has always been my favorite World War II ship. I mean, it went through everything. It was the only battleship at Pearl Harbor that was able to get underway during the Japanese attack because... You know, again, the minor little thing that changes the course of events. Instead of uh, having just one boiler providing electric electrical power to the ship while it's moored at Fort Island, uh, they had two boilers uh, bringing steam because they were about to switch over. And that gave them enough energy to cast loose and get underway before the Japanese attack uh, had gotten to the second wave. And, and there were a whole cast of heroes in that. Um, I wanted to try and do some in-depth writing about it, and I later wrote some articles um, for a rival publication. Um, well, we, we won't. Along, the, along the way, I ran into uh, the Pearl Har or the Nevada Survivors Association, which was down to like 16 guys. I mean, you know, we're at the end game of, of the greatest generation, and I've, I've learned it. Just if I find one of these guys, I just really want to get to know him and get the story out because... You're not going to be around too much longer. And I came across Dick Ramsey. He, he was a, not a Johnny-come-lately, but after Pearl Harbor, um, the ship was towed back or got underway in its own steam and went back to the West Coast for a major uh, upgrade. And, you know, before Pearl Harbor, there were about, I believe it was about 2,200, uh, don't quote me on this, but say 2,200 sailors manning the battleship. And one of the obvious lessons learned from Pearl Harbor was that there weren't enough anti-aircraft de uh, defending guns on board to, to make a difference. They got lucky and I think shot down three or four planes during the attack. But but over, all in all, the Navy quickly realized we've got to really upgun these ships for defense. And so while I was in the shipyard uh, during late 1942, uh, early 43, they added... Um, eight twin-barreled 5-inch 38 uh, secondary battery guns to the ship. Now, this is what gives the battleship its bristling look. You, you look on the beam uh, to the side of the ship, and you see four of these turrets on each side, um, each one of which has two barrels. So that's a total of 16 of these guns. They're capable of firing every two seconds, uh, either at, at air, 
you know, aircraft or ground uh, targets. Well, the thing that was amazing is each one of those guns needed between 35 and 40 people to operate because the gun team was about a dozen guys. And then they had to have three, three teams per barrel, that's six per turret, to, to, to man the thing 24 hours a day. So suddenly the population of the, of the USS Nevada increased, I think it was about 400 guys. So, as he said, it was crowded before we got there, and it was really crowded after we got there. And so he, he got out of boot camp in early uh, May 43. He, he had been a shipyard worker at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and actually had, had worked on battleships as, as, a, as a, a pipe fitter's uh, apprentice. But he, he, he enlisted in the Navy and immediately received what I say the, is a sailor's experience in the Navy. He went to Great Lakes, he excelled in boot camp. They promised him the top guys would get whatever they want. He volunteered for submarines and they sent him to a battleship. So nothing new there. Um, and he got to the ship and joined uh, the gunnery team just in time for the Nevada to go uh, back to the Atlantic for the final chapter or the final chapters of its, of its post uh, Pearl Harbor experience. During the course of World War II, the Nevada was the only battleship that I could find that fought everywhere. It fought in the Aleutians, it fought in the Atlantic shipping lanes as a, as a convoy escort, believe it or not. Um, it was the flagship gunship at Utah Beach in Normandy, which is why I'm very pleased to, to note that my friend Dick Ramsey, age 99, is in Normandy as we speak enjoying the first time he's visited since June 6, 1944. Well, this time he's on land. That's um, fantastic. So the Nevada essentially went from there to the Mediterranean for the second invasion of France, which was Operation Anvil in Toulon in August mm -hmm. of 44. Well, they, they thought, okay, we've gotten that done. The ship went back to the East Coast for another overhaul refit. And then they got orders to the Pacific and, and they were the flagship, uh, the gunnery bombardment force at Iwo Jima, and then were a pivotal player at the w worst battle of the war, Okinawa. The remarkable. He was, he was really that whole time. The Forrest Gump of World War II battle wagons. It was everywhere <laughs> where it was happening <laughs> at every key point. It's quite an amazing war record. And uh, well, he'll, be, he'll be the first to tell you he didn't see that much of it because his general quarter station was inside a twin-barreled gun turret, banging mm -hmm. away every two seconds. He said, "After about a half an hour, we were, you know, we weren't even thinking anymore. We were just parts of the machine, loading, firing, and unloading, and aiming and pointing." So he said, "He said he was proud of his service." But he said he didn't get to see that much. <laughs> That's often the case. You'll often hear that. Um, our uh, uh, one of the two um, individuals are. Uh, headquarters here and is named after Beach Hall. Ned Beach Senior was at the Battle. Of Manila, he was at the Battle of Manila Bay, but he didn't see anything. I mean, he was down below while all this was going on, and uh, so his impression of this epochal battle is like you're describing with Dick Ramsey. Right. Such is often the case, but still, you're there. You're part of it. You're in the you're mix. That's right. And, well, he had he had a wondrously horrible close call at Okinawa. Um, he had a bunk uh, compart birthing compartment about three or four decks down from the water line. And he'd just gotten off of like a four or six hour general quarter shift, exhausted. Went back down, got in his bunk, was just nodding off when the air alarm went off again and he jumped up and ran to a secondary uh, gunnery station. Oh, Lord. And about 15 minutes after he got out of his bunk bed, uh, Japanese field artillery piece on shore cranked off six rounds that hit the Nevada. Uh, and one of the rounds punched through three decks and went right through his bunk. Good been Lord. In his bunk. He would have had a Japanese six inch artillery shell go right through him. So he said, Good he said, gracious. Oh my goodness. I mean, that probably just haunted him for the rest of the conflict you know how close shave he had right at the outset of it amazing yeah his memories of it are quite vivid to this day i would think so well he was born under a lucky star that proves it right there um 
And um, it's wonderful to see those who remain from that generation um, still lucid, still with a story to tell. There's so many stories that came out of that war that people will never hear now. Um, and each one kind of fills in the details of the picture that much more. And uh, this one did that remarkably well, I thought so. And um, like I say, it's getting a lot of traffic uh, on our website. So I, if you haven't gone to it yet, I recommend you do. It's a really uh, evocative piece. And it's wonderful to hear this kind of thing from the person who experienced it. As you've said, that's going to be a rarer and rarer opportunity. Right. It is. It is. Well, so I'm, um, I'm glad. To... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I said it. One of the things I never, you know, consciously said, well, I'll do this during my career is that over the years, it's been an absolute wondrous experience to meet a number of the, the real greatest generation uh, pieces. I, I actually got to know quite well Don Ross, who was a Medal of Honor recipient from the Nevada at Pearl Harbor. He was one of, I think, only six or seven who received the, the medal who weren't dead from the attack. And, and he, he just was a, think of a, a, an Irish tenor with, with, with a cane belting out naval ballads in his van as we went down to the, the USS Nevada follow-on, the Trident sub. And he starts getting so into his Irish ballads, he starts swinging the cane, and we almost drove off the road, but that's another story. <laughs> but just to have met these guys, and, and you know what? They're just people, but they are such amazing examples of what to me the american sailor is and was and and i didn't tell my editors this but i just started savoring these encounters because it was so special yeah well that was sort of the um apex moment in america's naval story world war ii and to to get to speak with and get to know those who were part of that yeah, I can see how that would be something you really got into. Um, did you meet many other veterans? Were you able to meet well, many other? Yeah, I had a, I, one, one of my more uh, profound experiences came back in 1991. I was working up at the Seattle Post Intelligencer, and it was coming up on the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, and I really wanted to go out to Hawaii and cover the, the, the ceremony. I mean, it really meant a lot to me. And I went to my editor and I said, I really want to go out and cover the Pearl Harbor 50th anniversary. And he said, why? And I said, well, I said there, I, I did a check and there's 800 members of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association living here in Washington state. It's a great story. He said, okay, you go interview them. I said, all right. So I did. And I met some amazing guys. I met a sailor who got five Purple Hearts, four of them in World War II. And he managed to get himself shot by a German, an Italian, and two a Japanese soldier, and a Japanese zero. And he was he was like a stores clerk. And so he told me that story. And, and I don't know if we have time, but it's quite amazing. But the, the the thing he said when I first met him, and he was sitting with a bunch of his of his veteran buddies in this in this um, nursing home out in Washington State, and he said the same thing that I heard all through my career. And that is, where the hell were you 20 years ago when more of us were around? And so I'd say, sorry. Yeah. Gonna, uh, well, everybody's speaking that now. You know, we all wish that we'd gotten to all these people when there was more time to do so. That's right. the sad fact of it. But that's an amazing thing. I mean, that's something for Ripley's, believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, that's like the, um, the Nevada's track record of being everywhere throughout the war. <laughs> Those purple hearts coming from... You, you got two minutes, I'll give them to you. He's on the Oklahoma. He was putting his pants on when the first of the six torpedoes hit. He comes running up on deck in his skivvies, right as the ship is capsizing. He looks up, there's a Japanese Zero flying at him with his guns blazing. He runs as fast as he could across the deck, dives headfirst down the other gangway hatch. As he's in midair diving, a bullet clips him in the, in the leg. Thank God didn't, you know, knock it off or anything. He falls into the compartment, the ship rolls over, he spends 40 hours hanging on to what used to be the bottom rung of the ladder, which is now the airspace at the top of the overturned ship. 
Mm. He said when they pulled him out, he looked like a raisin that had been soaked so much it was back to being a grape again. <laughs> well, he spent six months in hospital, and he took pity on him and put him on a transport ship in the Mediterranean. So he went back and forth, back and forth from North Africa to Sicily, just hauling supplies. Got terminally bored, volunteered for a working party to, to drive truckloads of supplies up to Patton's Third Army up in the mountains. So he and a buddy got in the truck, they drove and they drove and they drove and the sun went down. And it got totally dark and they got lost. And they went into this little village and he beat the horn and rolled the window down and these three soldiers came out and he says, hey, is this Patton's Third Army? And the soldier said, nine. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so he ends up in a, in a POW camp. And he, uh, he successfully escapes, but uh, either a German or an Italian, I can't remember, uh, shoots him in the rear end. But he gets back and, you know, he gets healed again. Um, then they send him back to the Pacific. And he gets to Iwo Jima, like, it's two weeks after the invasion. Everything is, you know, quote unquote quiet, although it really wasn't. There were still snipers and whatever. And so he he talked a friend into letting him ride to the shore on a landing craft. He wanted to collect some souvenirs. So he's walking up through this ravine, you know, looking around and looking for a flag or a sword, I don't know what. And and this Japanese guy pops out of a foxhole and shoots him in the ass. <laughs> the fourth one I can't remember, but this guy had a great war. He just brought it on himself. <laughs> That is a unique war record for some one person to accrue. And each one of them is kind of a fluke incident in and of itself. And you put them all together, you've got a heck of a story there. I call uh, it self-inflicted self purple heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, we could talk sea stories all day because that's what we love here, are sea stories. That's our stock and trade. And um, so many of them came out of that war. And uh, we're always looking to see more of that. So I'll invite you to um, bring anything else that way to us um, along those lines, because we would probably be very interested. And uh, the fact you were able to speak with all these individuals, um, that's a gift. And um, to, to have um, learned of their stories and compiled them together and all that, it's a uh, that's a real gift. And uh, I thank you for um, adding great content this month to our print edition as well as our online edition. Uh, Double Threat Ed Offley. Thank you very much for joining us again on the podcast, Ed. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And Enjoy it very much. We, we certainly hope to have occasion to have you back on here again. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll get out and start doing some research. Sounds great. Until then, take care. Okay. That's it for us, folks, for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, signing off. Until next time.